Hey there, everyone, and welcome back to another Sunday night edition of the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Harris. With me, as always, is Mike Tagliere. You can find us on Twitter at DanHarris80 and at Mike Tagliere NFL. Tags, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, we were talking before the show, just before we turned it on, because it's like uh, the Saints-Rams game is still going on. There's three minutes, 52 seconds left. The Saints just scored a touchdown, and it just happened to be Michael Thomas, the guy that... Uh, I had a lot of exposure to in DFS this week, so I'm a pretty happy guy right now. Yeah, oddly enough, it's rare that you forget to cover Michael Thomas, but that seemed to be what they did on that play, a long touchdown catch. Yeah, so if you are going to hear any screaming or live reaction going on, it is just because this is the last game and it's going on. The other uh, four o'clock games just ended. They all had fantastic finishes, and we will touch on all of them, of course, but let us start as we always do, Tags, and give me your biggest react. What What's the big thing that stood out to you today? What's the biggest thing that stood out to me today? Um, that there's or multiple so, things. Whatever thing, you want, buddy. There's there's so many, right? Hit like, me with like, a few. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna rattle off a few here for you. So Isaiah Crowell is who he thought he was. Um, Kenyon Drake cannot be trusted. If your name is Sean, you may be a great play caller. Um, <laughs> never take your foot off the gas against the Rams, and that the Raiders are worse than we may have ever thought possible. Okay, to be fair, the Raiders could not possibly have stood out to you today because it was a Thursday not game, today. but that I was going to be my question once we got to that game is legitimately, have you ever seen a team quit like the Raiders did on Thursday? Yeah, the Giants did last year uh, um, on Ben McAdoo. That team was one you could target with any position in fantasy football, and it was just like, like a godsend. So it reminds me kind of what happened with the Giants last year where, I mean, I don't know if the, the Raiders as a team are giving up. I knew Bruce Irvin did, and that's why he's no longer on the team. Uh, but at the same time, I just don't think that they have the talent to hang with the teams that they're playing against, even when it comes to playing against, you know, a 49ers team that is, has their third string quarterback playing. And, uh, you know, they were, I want to say that they were like two and a half point favorites in that game, despite that, which just kind of tells you where the Raiders are as a franchise. Then they go and they lose 34 to three. So man, uh, John Gruden, 10 years, hundred million dollars. How's that working out for you? Well, to be fair, I mean, if you if you think that just any defense can stop Nick Mullins, then you're really kind of, I don't really feel like you know football. <laughs> Literally, I had never heard of Nick Mullins. I, I could not have named who C.J. Bethard's backup was. But uh, anyway, uh, out of curiosity, just because we're not going to spend that much time talking about the Raiders, so I do want to ask a couple things. A, how long do you think Gruden lasts in that contract? Um, How long do I think? He, I mean... I'm going to say a minimum of three years because I think what's going to happen is they're going to have him for next year, obviously, and then they're going to move to Vegas, and I think they give him one year there, and if they don't get that turnaround, because they've obviously mortgaged their stars that they had on the team between Khalil Mack and Amari Cooper, and now Bruce Irvin's gone. Um, I wouldn't call him a star, but... Uh, at the same time, he can help a team. I think they're going to give him, you know, they're going to let him have the draft and then they're going to give him two years to see that because you can't really judge a rookie in his like in his first year in the NFL. So I would say they'll give him two years with those rookies. Uh, and then from there, man, uh, the Raiders, poor, poor uh, run franchise right now. All right. Well, you know what? I was going to ask a second question, but frankly, I really feel like we have given the Raiders more attention yeah, than they deserve, frankly. Sure. So let's just move on. Um, usually we do winners and losers, but uh, for this week, I want to do something a little different. And I tweeted out before the game started, which, if anybody had any reaction to any of the games that were played and had any questions for us, they could just tweet at us um, and we would try to answer them on the show. So a bunch of people responded. So these are couple of the questions that I got on Twitter. So we'll start with uh, the Viking situation with Dalvin Cook looking healthy, but Latavius Murray continuing to do well. What does the Vikings running game look like going forward? It's going to be a split. Um, that's how I, I view it. Uh, I was actually going through that game while watching the afternoon games because like time is of the essence and we have to kind of figure out you know how to spend that. Uh, but I was looking at the snap counts. I was looking at the carry totals and the red zone usage. And uh, they each got 10 carries in this game. Outside of that one carry that Dalvin Cook had that went for 70 yards, he had nine carries for 19 yards. And he didn't get a single red zone carry, whereas Latavius Murray had three of them. So I do believe, you know, yes, he was on a snap count, but did he look good? Yeah, he looked fine. This offensive line has never been good, knowing that they they were missing Stefan Diggs today. I mean, the defense was able to kind of like shut down Adam Thielen. Uh, and that's the thing that, you know, the Lions players have talked about is saying once Matt Patricia came there, their, their, their mindset on defense was going to be to take away the team's top option, kind of like the Patriots do. And they did that with Adam Thielen. I don't think they paid any extra attention to the run game. And, you know, Latavius Murray scored. I think it's going to be like a 60-40 split. I think it's going to be Dalvin Cook for 60% of the time, Latavius for 40. I still think Latavius gets just as many, if not more, goal line opportunity, though, because he has done it the last two years. There is no reason that they should take him out of that role. So 
Delvin Cook, to me, is a sell high right now. Yeah, this is kind of... First of all, I cannot believe he was active for this game, considering mm-hmm. that they had the their bye. bye next week. Now, yep. he did come out of this completely healthy, as far as I can tell, so I guess it doesn't hurt them, but it was really, really surprising. He also had a terrible fumble. I, I don't know if he actually gets credited with the fumble, because it was a pitch, so he right. never actually had control, but regardless, he made a terrible play there. Yeah, I think this is, frankly, the way this has worked out, it's just the worst case scenario for owners, because mm-hmm. I, I know I own Cook in one league. I was lucky enough to snag Murray, but now neither one of them really carries RB1 value going forward because they are going to split. I think that's exactly right. I think Murray has... Now, he didn't have a great game. I think he had just 31 yards, but he certainly has done enough, and I do think that the goal line works. So I agree. I think you're probably looking at a roughly 60-40 split. I think that was actually exactly what I was thinking about, Um, but I think it really hurts both of their value, unfortunately, going forward. Uh, Number two is Elijah Maguire, the best back to own on the Jets going forward. He might be. Um, you know, I, I kind of didn't I didn't think he would be used very much in this game. Like I figured the first game off foot surgery coming in the field. So I, I didn't get to see too much of this game, to be honest with you. I'll go back and watch it. But the field conditions I were to, I was told are, were terrible in Miami, that the game that was played, a college game was played in there Saturday and that the field conditions were going to be brutal uh, in terms for a passing game. So I figured it'd be a short game. I thought Crowell would get a lot of work and I figured McGuire I kind of vision, envision him getting like six to eight touches in his first game. He finished the game with uh, 10 touches, which is somewhat close to what Bilal Powell was getting. Uh, he averaged 13 touches per game in his role. So he's going to get more touches like going forward. And it seems like Isaiah Crowell is just somebody they don't want to trust with the entire workload. And honestly, after watching parts of that game, I can't really fault them for that. I think Elijah Maguire is the better three down back. I don't, I don't know if I've seen enough to say that he's the best back to own there, but he's definitely part of a timeshare. I would say that in standard, I'd probably stick with Crowell because I think Mm -hmm. he's going to get probably the majority of the touches and I think he will get the goal line work to the extent they ever approach the goal line again which I'm not sure that they will yeah I think in any sort of PPR or half PPR format I think McGuire is going to be better I was really surprised that they gave him this much work coming in it wasn't even sure that he would be active coming into Mm -hmm. this game and instead he got a lot of work so I think frankly I'd still go with Crowell and standard but in any format that awards anything for receptions I would go with McGuire number three are you worried about Jarvis Landry yeah, I have been for a long time. And I, I like I think it goes back to Jarvis Landry. I think there's a reason that like an NFL team, when you have a player as long as the Dolphins had Jarvis Landry, I think they figured out kind of what he was. And I think the Browns have tried to make him more than that. And it's not to say that he's not a good NFL receiver, but he's never an alpha dog. He should not be your leading receiver. He shouldn't be getting you know, 12 to 15 targets per game like he's been getting. He's been inefficient with those targets. And is it some of it on Mayfield? Is it some of it on the offense? Yeah, sure. But at the same time, he has to deliver getting all those targets. Like, there is no excuse. I think he's seen at least 10 targets in all but one game this season or something like that. So the targets are there. Uh, The production is not. They've had a really good spot in their schedule. I think they're playing the Falcons next week. So it's another good matchup. But the production just doesn't match it. So I am a little worried. I have him as my number 20 wide receiver the rest of the season. And I don't feel great about it. Yeah, I'm worried as well. Uh uh, if you go back the last four games, and this is kind of the stretch that we were waiting for, he had the big game against the Bucks. But other than that, today was his best day with six catches for 50 yards. I mean, he has really whatever the reason is, if it's him, if it's the offense as a whole, I just I've kind of been waiting for this kind of the same way. I feel like I've been waiting for Keenan Allen. Um, mm-hmm. And today Allen delivered, right. but Landry really didn't. And I'm just not confident in him going forward. So I don't know exactly where I'm going to have him ranked. But certainly uh, in standard leagues, I- I'm not at all excited by him anymore. And anything that rewards, again, anything for receptions, then he's certainly going to be more than relevant. Yeah. But I think the big breakout that we're waiting for is just not happening. Not would you rather offense. have, my question to you is, like, would you rather have Jarvis Landry or, let's I'll give you two other names, Marvin Jones and Josh Gordon? Uh, are we standard? Let's do half PPR. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I think, boy, that that's pretty close. Uh, coming in... I had Landry two spots ahead of Gordon and actually a couple spots behind Jones uh, coming in. So I think that's probably where uh, we haven't seen the game um, between the uh, Patriots and the Packers yet. So I don't know how it's going to look. I'm a little worried about Gordon, to be honest, Um, you know, whether or not the rumors about him being late that time. I know he's still soft full um, or his health or anything like that. So my guess is in half point PPR. I'd still probably take Jones because, I mean, he had six catches today. I do Mm -hmm. think he's going to be involved going forward. Um, But they're all around the same area. So I'd probably have him ranked uh, Jones, Landry, and then Gordon. How about you? 
Yeah, I actually have it uh, Jones, Landry, then Gordon, uh, just because of the concerns around Gordon, but they're all in the same territory, and that's why I wanted to ask you that question. But Marvin Jones definitely took a jump. Last couple weeks, he's seen a lot more targets. Galladay, I think, has six targets over the last two weeks, which is a little worrisome, but I'm not I'm not completely like worried about it. I think Galladay is like a buy low right now in fantasy just because— well, Let me ask you one thing before you keep going there, because yeah. about that game, are you worried— uh, I mean, was this just a t- I, I thought this wasn't that terrible a spot because, you know, Xavier Rhodes, he was very Playing, questionable going yeah, in. Right. Yeah, but did you see, by the yep. way, that they had actually written him inactive and then crossed his name out uh-huh. right before? Yeah, uh, but he was in and out of this game even. So I thought it might not have been a terrible spot, but they didn't really do anything. Do you think that it was just the matchup or was it the lack of Golden Tate? Do you think that affected anything and will affect anything with the two receivers going forward? I think it was a combination of a lot of different things, right? You had like Theo Riddick coming back to the offense. You lost Golden Tate, a guy that Matt, Matthew Stafford has played with for the past years, like Golden Tate never misses a game. So like it, it, his safety blanket was gone. All of a sudden, with that safety blanket out of the picture, you saw Matthew Stafford take, I think it was nine sacks today, yep. uh, which was a, a, a career high for him. So the Lions offensive line had been doing better in this game. I think it was just like a, a combination of everything. And I am a little bit worried that the Lions team as a whole didn't take the Golden Tate trade very well. Like, I don't think that they liked the fact that they felt like they were in a playoff race uh, because the NFC North, like the Bears have certainly not pulled away with that division. So that there was a chance, especially with two of the next three games coming up against the Bears. I don't know. It, it's weird to see the team not show up like they did today because that was that game was not a contest at all. Um, no, but no. I, well, out of curiosity, Tex, why do you think they traded for Snacks Harrison and then traded away Tate? What were they doing? It's really odd. And like, that's a, a rumor. I don't even want to say a rumor, a like conversation that Golden Tate had with uh, someone. I think it was a beat reporter, Dave Burkett of Detroit, said that it's we, he, that Golden Tate was kind of shocked by it all because they were working on a contract extension that they were really apparently close to. And the next thing he knows, he's being traded uh, where the Lions were unwilling to budge on a third round, uh, the third round price that they were asking. But I mean, really, what's the difference between a third and fourth round? Is it that big of a difference to where Golden Tate that I mean, if they really wanted him to be there, I think he should be there. And I. I just don't think this sat very well with the team, but that's beside the point. The idea, though, is that Golden Tate, Marvin Jones, uh, Kenny Galladay, those when all three of those were together, they averaged like 23 targets per game. I, I I'm not gonna like sit here and pretend that this game is going to completely change their entire offense. So I, I expect Kenny Galladay to get back up in the higher target variety very soon. So I think he's a buy low, but Marvin Jones definitely is moving up the ranks. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, Tate was seeing roughly 10 targets a game. I yep. mean, they've got to go somewhere. And Riddick, again, returned today. So that did make a difference uh, more about Kerryon Johnson, which we'll talk about a little bit more when we get to the game. Um, but it certainly just was a, a really disappointing effort uh, from the Lions, especially given the injuries that the Vikings had. Uh, OK, fourth question that we got on Twitter. Uh, what did Kenyon Drake do to Adam Gase to make him hate him? <laughs> I don't think they actually expect you to answer that precise question, but I think it's much more about the fact that Frank Gore got 20 carries and Kenyon Drake got three carries. Yeah, with a running back like this, um, man, I I feel like a little bit going up and down and I hate doing it. But the thing is, is like Kenyon Drake, he's the type of running back that can lose you your fantasy season just like that. Like, you know, running backs, you should rely on touches like you should be able to guarantee your running back at least 10 touches per game. And Kenyon Drake, I was looking this up earlier, too. It's like there's been uh, five of the last seven games. He has totaled six carries or less. Ugh. But yeah. you actually but you gave a great stat earlier this week on the podcast. So isn't he a opportunities? Top, right. Yeah. yeah. But but isn't he a top 15 back or something coming into this game? Yes, for he this was. Season? He, he was. That's the thing is like he was a top 20 running back. And that just goes to show how bad the landscape has been. But at the same time, it also it, Kenyon Drake's been propped up by a few big games. Um, so it's. But the thing is, is like performances like this where he sees three carries and, and Frank Gore sees 20 in a game that they both should have been getting carries. Like if Frank Gore was not efficient. He had 53 yards on his 20 carries. Uh, the Jets have been able to be run on. I have no idea what happened here. I know Miami won the game. So, I mean, OK, <laughs> I mean, if you're a Dolphins fan, if you're feeling good about this win, I don't know what else to tell you, but it was not a pretty game. Um, from what I saw, like I said, the field conditions were bad. It was built for a run game. I figured Kenyon Drake would be involved. He did see six targets in the passing game, but Osweiler with the way that he's performed the last few weeks, I think it's more than likely they're going to go back to Ryan Tannehill and Tannehill didn't target Kenyon Drake nearly as much as Osweiler has. So I don't know. I'm worried. And I, I just, I want to get away from running backs that have this much volatility. And it's not like Kenyon Drake has shown, massive massive like league winning upside this year with Frank Gore on the team 
Yeah, well, as we said last week, you we had the Cracked Out Award, which was the player that makes you go nuts, and he was mine because yeah. I really never know how to feel about him. And I love Kenyon Drake, the player. The player, I, really I do, do too, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But we talk about it all the time. It's so much more than just talent. It's, you know, the most important thing is opportunity, and he really doesn't have it. I don't even know if it's – I'm trying to think back to the, the Dolphins' last few games, whether or not it's game script, um, something like that, because I know he has – he's so involved in the passing game. I guess I'm trying to remember whether or not it's always – because they're behind or if he's just involved in the passing game generally but this was bizarre and again the field look I watched a little more closely because I'm a Jets fan the field although it was uh, you know this morning they talked about how terrible it was it looked okay it, it didn't look great but it didn't look terrible I didn't think they would I was like are they protecting him or something I don't know maybe they just thought you know what the Jets can't score on us which is a fair point and so we're just going to rely on Gore and run him into the ground but whatever it is I think it's fair to say we're both concerned with Kenyon Drake going forward uh final Twitter question question and this one is specifically for you uh i am worried about Tariq cohen help me tags you're my only hope he's a buy low jordan howard is a sell high um, okay cohen has been a victim of game script the last two weeks and um this was something i wanted to look forward at the Bears' schedule to kind of figure out and see where i where i landed with this because obviously if you have games against the jets and the bills every other week that's gonna be a problem for Tariq cohen because we're gonna see jordan howard out there a lot in clock killing mode uh but looking at their upcoming schedule they play the Vi- the Lions twice over the next three weeks, and even like the Lions have been a terrible run defense, but the Lions Bears it's a divisional game. Those games are always close. The Bears, I can't tell you the last time the Bears blew out the Lions. I don't think it happens just like overnight. I don't think that happens. Uh, they play the Vikings in there. They play the Rams and they play the Packers. So at five of their next six opponents. They, they could fall behind in those games, and it's going to be a much tighter game where Tariq Cohen is going to be used. Looking at Jordan Howard, he has only seen four targets in the last five games, so he is not being utilized in the passing game at all. Tariq Cohen is kind of like that utility knife that they're going to use in every single situation. They're going to use him on trick plays, this and that. I have Tariq Cohen as my number 19 running back for the rest of the season, uh, and that's in standard leagues. In PPR, I would move him into the top 15. Uh, whereas Jordan Howard, I have him as my RB23. I would actually prefer to own Tariq Cohen going forward than Jordan Howard, uh, who, by the way, his snap counts since week one, he played 71% of the snaps, 73, then 62, 54, 51, 56, 57, 51. So he has settled in into a 50 to 57% of snap type player. And if he doesn't score a touchdown, he's really going to let you down. He just looks like he's playing in slow motion behind this offense, the loss of, uh, the uh, Bears guard Kyle Long, that's going to affect it. The run game, I mean, it was the Bills today. <laughs> it, yeah. It was the Bills. Like it was the Jets last week. And he he honestly looked terrible until the last drive of that game. So um yeah, Jordan Howard is sell high to me. Uh, Tariq Cohen, I'm not worried about. Yeah, no, I mean, I you know, I don't want to have to just basically say ditto, but ditto. I mean, you know, I had actually Tariq Cohen at 16 and Jordan Howard at 25 coming in. And I don't really think this game changes anything. It was a positive game script. The Bills had no Tremaine Edwards. It was so an even uh, additional uh, boon to Howard. But again, that's really the thing. If you believe that uh, the Bears are going to be playing with a positive game script every game going forward, then yeah, maybe you'd be a little worried about Tariq Cohen. But that's not what it's going to be. I think they are well aware that he is the key to their offense at this point and I think they're going to utilize him much more going forward I know it is scary to see the fact that he only got seven touches today six touches last week but again it really was game script so I totally agree I would not be at all worried about Tariq Cohen going forward and um, if you can sell high on Jordan Howard after this game boy do it and do Mm -hmm. it quick because I don't really expect too much going forward All right, so before we get into the game recaps, uh, I do want to tell everybody about the sponsor of today's show, Lisa Mattress. Now, if you've both got little kids and you're a night owl like I am, then you know how important it is to get a quality night's sleep. It helps you recover from distractions faster. It prevents burnout. It helps you make better decisions. It improves your memory and overall make fewer mistakes. And to design a better mattress, Lisa leveraged 30 plus years of experience and hundreds of hours of testing to develop the perfect mattress for all body shapes and sleeping styles. Now, trust me, it's by far the most comfortable mattress that I've ever slept on. And frankly, that alone, along with a great price, would be more than enough. But Lisa is also a really fantastic company that cares about the community. Lisa's mission is to provide a better night's sleep for everybody. So they have this thing called the 110 program where they donate one mattress for every 10 they sell. That's more than 26,000 mattresses and counting. And while the mattress donations are awesome, that's not all Lisa does. Together with the Arbor Day Foundation, Lisa plants one tree for every mattress they sell, and they're committed to planting 1 million trees by 2025. With our offer code, you can get $160 off a Lisa mattress. Just go to lisa.com slash fantasypros. That's l-e-e-s-a dot com slash fantasypros. 
All right, Tags, let's touch very briefly on the Thursday night game. 49ers 34, Raiders 3. The Raiders completely quit. Uh, you know, not to dwell on the Raiders at all, mm-hmm. but, I mean, who is ownable? I mean, Doug Martin ran fairly well, 11 carries for 49 mm-hmm. yards. Is there anyone else ownable in a standard league on the Raiders? I mean, the fact that Doug Martin's not being used in the passing game, it even knocks him down a bit. Like, he's kind of like a Frank Gore type guy where it's like, you know, he's going to get carries, but he's not going to win you a league, but he's also not going to lose it. You know he's going to get 10 to 15 touches per week, and that's fine for an RB3 territory but outside that I don't want to own anybody on this team like what about Jared Cook even him uh you know like against the 49ers like two targets in a game where they 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 fell behind I know the time possession was crazy on San Francisco side and Derek Carr I think only threw the ball 20 some time like it was like low 20s 24 times maybe um but Jared Cook just he's been this guy throughout his career and knowing that Amari Cooper's not there t- defenses don't have to necessarily focus on anybody anymore and it's like a tight end who has been seeing the majority of the targets, he becomes more of a focal point for a defense. And it's, he's just not talented enough to do that. And Derek Carr is not a talented enough quarterback to consistently get him the ball. So uh, uh, no, I don't want any part of it. (laughs) I think I'd probably still own cook just with the landscape of tight end, but I I agree. I mean, it's just a disastrous sort of year. And you know, I, what is the, what are the chances that John Gruden's secretly a genius and is just tanking right now so that he can get everything going? I mean, you'll give it 5%. I mean, we've, we've watched Colton Miller, right? He's their, yeah, he's their yeah. first round pick on the offensive yeah. line. And all of a sudden people watch the Raiders offensive line. They're like, wait a minute. I thought this was supposed to be a top five unit. Yeah. Colton Miller was a reach. It was a bad pick. And that's the thing is like looking at the even, you know, go back to Carl Joseph. I, I know it was a different regime, like the head coach and stuff like that. But Gruden better nail these draft picks because that 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 roster is talent depleted. Yeah, absolutely. It certainly is one of the uh, worst teams of football right now. On the other side of the ball, Nick Mullins, we mentioned him, one mm-hmm. of the best debuts in history, pass a rating of 151.9, highest for a quarterback in the modern era, with at least 20 attempts making his debut. Uh, Raheem Mostert breaks his arm. He's out for the season. I guess a slight bump to the cyborg, Matt Breida. I don't <laughs> know if that's his actual nickname, by the way, but I'm bestowing it upon nice. him. He is the cyborg because I love him. Pierre Garçon, first touchdown as a 49er. Congratulations. Um, look, they're hosting the Giants on Monday Night Football next week. Week. That's a, a fantastic matchup. But is there any pass catcher on this offense that you want to own other than George Kittle? Mm, no. That I, is I, correct. I, yeah, Marquise Goodwin's a fine bye week option. Uh Garcon, I'm not gonna I'm not going that route. Like that was his first touchdown since it was 2016. I know that. Um I'm hold on a second. I'm gonna look it up because I need to know. Uh <laughs> it was his first touchdown since week four of two thousand or week fourteen of two thousand sixteen. Um, yeah. Pierre Garcon is not a touchdown scorer. And the thing is Mullins, yeah, he had a good game and I'm not going to, I don't want to take anything away from him, but we've seen Trevor Simeon have an awesome debut. I remember Brock Osweiler for a little bit. Uh, he looked good and it's just like, these things happen from time to time. I'm not going to buy into it until I actually see it again. Uh, I need to see a trend, uh, and playing against the Raiders. I think we should take that with somewhat of a grain of salt. Like again, he looked good. I'm not, I don't want to take that away, but he did have a, a matchup where he wasn't pressured very much. He didn't have to do very much. Like the, he just had to manage the game is all he had to do, and he did a very good job of that. But um, I, I'm with not. That, with that said, though, to be fair, you'll probably. I assume, by the way, I don't. I don't think he's officially been named the starter for mm-hmm. next week, or maybe he has at this point. But I assume he's going to start, and I assume that. I mean, you'll be mildly interested, perhaps, as a streamer against the Giants hosting, right? I mean, are you just completely discounting this? Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not going to completely discount it. Um, the Giants matchup. I don't know if it's as great as everyone thinks it is. I think it's better for running backs at this point in the season, uh, especially without Harrison on the defensive line. Uh, but, you know, it's something I'll look at for sure. Like, I'm going to go back and watch that Mullins game. It's like you get caught up in the notion of all the Thursday night, not everybody on Twitter talking so much and saying, oh, how did they not know this? And Jimmy Garoppolo is going to get traded. Right. And I, I know it's a bunch of like tongue in cheek stuff, but I don't know. I'm not willing to say that Mullins is like a franchise quarterback and that the Giants should trade for him or anything like that. I want to see it before I trust it in fantasy football. No, just to be clear, I am not advocating going out there and dropping your established quarterback for Nick Mullins right. or anything like that. Right. Um, but, you know, it was a it was a fun debut anyway, mm-hmm. uh, if if uh, nothing else. Uh, Bears 41, Bills 9. We have touched on this game. Of course, yep. there is not a better spot for a DST than this one. Um, and they deliver even without Khalil Mack. They scored the two defensive touchdowns. But tags, I mean, I don't know how you're feeling. I believe, I think I read this, that it was the first rushing touchdown that the Bears allowed. Uh, it was well. The thing is, it was it was, but they still have not allowed one to running backs because Look, it, it, Nathan Peterman, man, he can do it all. If yeah. there's one thing we know about, him. <laughs> yeah, Nathan Peterman, um, just he looked every bit as bad as everybody thinks he does. Yeah. Uh, this was an easy game for the Bears. The only thing I, I really take away from this one is that Taylor Gabriel left the game 
uh, late. I don't know what was wrong. It looked like they were examining him for a knee injury, which would be really worrisome. Uh, and we have seen Anthony Miller start to come alive. Him and Trubisky got on the same page. He he had a season high in, in uh, receptions and, and yards. I know it wasn't much, but he's now seen uh, seven, seven, and six targets over the last three weeks. So he's starting to get involved more and more. It was a tough matchup for Trey Burton. So to see him come through the touchdown obviously is nice. But um, yeah, th- I, this was a this is a really boring game to watch. To be it honest was. with you, it was, do you think do you think Miller's usage takes a hit when Allen Robinson returns? It will, um, because Robinson was moving all around the formation. They were having him play in the slot, but I don't think it happens right away. I think uh, like on Robinson, they might ease him back into the offense. But like I said, if Gabriel is forced to miss some time with an with an injury. Like they're going to need some options because again, Trubisky only threw the ball twenty times this week. Going against the Jets last week, it was in the low twenties, I believe, as well. So they're going to have to throw the ball going forward. So to see Anthony Miller with the target share he's had over the last couple of weeks with such low volume in the offense, I think Anthony Miller is like here to stay. I'm not saying he's like a, a very high option, like a you know high upside option, but I do think he's presenting a somewhat stable floor for those who are are de- dealing with some bye week issues for the next couple of weeks. Yeah, absolutely. I used him this week, um, and I'm happy with what I got. I mean, in half point PPR, 49 yards, five catches. I think that's mm-hmm. fine. I think he had a, a rush as well, so that wasn't bad. And uh, again, I, I doubt anybody is, uh, you know, too upset about the Trubisky's game. But if you are, I mean, it's a a very clear uh, matter of game. I mean, the Bears, the uh, Bills are decent against the pass anyway. But it was. I mean, he didn't need to do anything. No, he didn't. And, game, it, right? Like honestly, it was one of Trubisky's better games. If I'm being right. honest. Oh, I was. Yes, I was gonna say that. Now he did throw a, a pretty terrible pick Ugly from pick, what yeah. I saw. Yeah, that was a bad one. But before that, I remember going in. I was saying like, you know, I I feel like he's playing better than I've seen him play in most of his other games. Yeah, where he's done well. Even though the stats don't show it. Yes, mm-hmm. this was probably his best game that he's played in a while. Yep. All right. On the other side of the ball, I mean, I don't know what to say about this. Is the only person that we ever talk about or we try to talk about is Lashawn McCoy, who just had a dreadful day. Ten carries for ten yards, four catches for nineteen yards. I know Chris Ivory, by the way, apparently a serious shoulder injury. I, I know uh, yeah. Ian Rappaport just tweeted out something about a him trauma being, center. Yeah, God, I I don't know what that's about, but obviously our our best wishes to him. Is there anything you want to say on the Bill side of the ball other than oh God, run for your lives? Yeah, run for your lives. Yeah, that's pretty, that's <laughs> that's pretty solid advice right yeah. there. Um, I will yeah. say that Charles Clay seems to have gotten benched for Logan Thomas. Um, former quarterback Logan Thomas, by the way, he saw eight well, targets. Was Clay was Clay injured though? I, I don't thought know if he, he might have left. Injured. Him. I didn't even have the sound on for that broadcast of the Bears game. Um, but I <laughs> How saw him, dare you? I saw him standing on the sideline with his helmet off, and like he just didn't. I, I, Honestly, I wouldn't be shocked if he was benched. That's why I was saying like he was just over there. He didn't see a target the entire game. I, so I don't know what's going on with Charles Clay, but he hasn't been very efficient. But I mean, if you were relying on Terrell yeah. Pryor, what is wrong with you? Yeah, no. And if you were relying on Charles Clay at this point, I mean, it's not, 20, it's not twenty. It's not twenty seventeen anymore, guys. Let's move on at this point. All right, Chiefs thirty seven, Browns twenty one. I mean. As if it's not hard enough to defend the Chiefs' offense, the Browns are completely decimated on defense. They lose Denzel Ward to a hip injury mm-hmm. right at the start of this game, and it's just business as usual for the Chief. Travis Kelsey, two touchdowns. Kareem Hunt, three touchdowns. Patrick Mahomes, three touchdowns. I mean, you can be upset with Tyree Kill. He didn't find the end zone, but is there anything you really want to say about the Chiefs' offense other than start all of them? Start all of them. That's that's go. the best advice that you can give. Um, yeah. yeah, Kareem Hunt was the lock of the week, man. I'm happy to see yeah. that one come through. Well, uh, they get the Cardinals next week, so I'm sure it's going to continue. <laughs> yeah, it should continue. That might be a week where Patrick Mahomes actually may not put up like historical numbers. Um, you know, you'd like to think that, but I doubt it. You're I probably think this right. is just what we're going to get every you're week. You're probably Matt. right. Tyreek Hill's going to be back to like 100% healthy from his injury. Sammy White. Yeah, th- th- this team is just, they're unguardable on offense. Like their defense has played better, actually, I think, than most people have thought and expected. Uh, especially at the cornerback position. Like, Orlando Skandrick's playing awesome. Kendall Fuller has started to play a lot better. But, yeah, I mean, the Chiefs are a contender, man. Like, I was always one to say that their defense is going to be the reason that they can't win, but um, their offense is more than potent enough to play along with that defense that's at least playing average football. Absolutely. Their defense is playing better than expected. And frankly, I'm not sure exactly when. Every every week I try to follow the practice reports, but Eric Berry's going to come back at some point, right? I, I mean, know. He's, yeah. is he really? Oh, I well, thought... Well, I thought from, Go ahead. from what I understand about Eric Berry is that so he had the Achilles injury. It, it was week one last year. He missed the entire season, rehabbed all off season, then he tried to come back. But the thing is, is like he started practicing and he's suffering some injuries in his legs, like uh, whether it be his ankle, his calf, or whatever. He's dealing with injuries that are often a result from someone who's coming back from an Achilles injury. So it's all stemming from that Achilles injury, and it's just it, it just goes to show it's a very very difficult injury to come back from. And uh, Eric Berry. Yes. I mean, it, will he come back at some point? I, I'm surprised they didn't put him on the pup list. If I, I don't think they expected him to be out this long, but he doesn't appear any closer to be returning, though. That's the concern. 
Yeah, no, well, that's fair. But again, if you're the Chiefs, all you have to do is say, well, we just want to get you ready for the playoffs if we can, because they're going to be there. They're going to be the number one or two seed, um, and they should be a force when they get there because it is really impressive to watch. On the other side of the ball, Freddie Kitchens takes over as offensive coordinator. And finally, in Exhibit A, as to coaches lie, he says Duke Johnson's role is going to be exactly the same, but he is actually unleashed nine catches for 78 yards and two touchdowns. It is worth noting that if you are ever going to actually pass to your running back, it is going to be against the Chiefs. They allow the most receiving yards to running backs. But do you think that this is a sign of things to come? Is Duke Johnson going to be somebody who fantasy owners can rely on in half point PPR or PPR formats? Uh, do I want to say rely on? Probably not. I, I mean, the running back position is so thin. I do have him in RB3 territory going forward. Um, it is a little worrisome to see him get one carry uh, compared to Nick Chubb's 22, which means it's going to rely on game script. Now, to be fair, Cleveland is probably not going to be in a positive game script very often. I mean, they're, they're a two and six team for a reason there. I mean, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. It's going to be hard to turn around in the middle of the season under new offensive coordinator under Greg Williams is your, is your head coach. Um, so I'm a little, look, worried. man, he had, he had like 10 offers. Okay. This is his oh, spot. I'm He's sure. been waiting for this one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. By the way, I think if you were ever, if you are, or if you were ever a coach for the Browns, I, I guess you're just completely forced to fabricate everything about yeah. your time there. Right. I mean, Hugh Jackson just totally making stuff up out the door. Well, and if you're, right? it, it, yeah. And if you're a Browns fan, by the way, um, there's rumblings about Mike McCarthy potentially going there as a head coach no. next year. If that happens, like legitimately find a new team. Ugh. God, well, I mean, haven't they suffered enough? I, I, why I, would they? I don't. I just. I want to root for the Browns. I actually do. Of course, I do want to root for them. Um, but I just, I, I won't do it under Greg Williams, and I, and I wouldn't do it under Mike McCarthy because I, I just know that's you're fighting a losing battle. Yeah. Well, at least Aaron Rodgers would be happy for the first time. Yeah, in that, that, years, that's so. the that's the plus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is the plus. Uh, Nick Chubb though does have the good game. Twenty two carries, eighty five yards, finds the end zone again. He is a reliable RB two. Um, going forward, uh, we touched on Jarvis Landry already. Is there anything else you want to say about the Browns? No, other than the fact that this game script, uh, the reason that Nick Chubb, I, I put him up to number 15 in my rest of season rankings for running backs. Uh, I feel very confident moving forward with him. Obviously, this is the first game under the new offensive coordinator, Freddie Kitchens. And uh, to know he had 22 carries in a game that they literally were behind the entire time, it's very, it's promising. Yeah, and he looked good. He looks, I mean, he looks like a solid NFL player. I had him, I believe, coming into this week at 21. He will be moving up mm-hmm. as well for me. Um, but yeah, an impressive uh, workload for him considering the game script I agree uh, Dolphins 13 Jets 6 so I saw a great tweet from a Dolphins beat writer Cameron Wolf that I think sums up this game perfectly and it was in the fourth quarter so the game was going on uh, quote in a battle between two bad offenses today the Jets offense seems to be slightly worse than the Dolphins <laughs> which I think is pretty much what this game was it, it was just and I am forced to watch it by the fact that I grew up in Queens and I'm a Jets fan um, it was as bad as that score. It, there are no offensive touchdowns. That's a pick six, to be clear. Um, at, look, man, <laughs> we there's very little to discuss in this game. We did discuss uh, the main thing, which is Frank Gore getting 20 carries and Kenny Drake seeing three. But, I, I mean, frankly, is there anything at all, fantasy-wise, that you want to take away from this game? No. I um, As I mentioned, Isaiah Crowell, I, uh, I, I just want to say this to my Crowell lovers and you know, Mike haters out there that I played Isaiah Crowell in cash today. I, I still managed to win because I had Michael Thomas and I had Kareem Hunt. Like those were good plays, but Isaiah Crowell has let me down for the last time. Like I, I, I gave in and I trusted him in a matchup that I felt like, okay, you know what? This is a matchup where he's going to get the work. He's going to, you know, I figured it was going to be a minimum of 80 total yards and a good shot at a touchdown against the Dolphins, but no, I couldn't even get that. He got 60 total yards on 14 touches. The Jets just seem more than content, not giving him the ball very much. And he hasn't looked very good the last few weeks either, but I want to ask you, like, let's say that we have dynasty listeners. Um, mm. and I know that a lot of people out there play dynasty. Now it's a, it's a format that a lot of people are starting to gravitate towards because it's just, it's like you have the feeling of like you're a general manager of a team. What are your thoughts on Sam Darnold? Like, obviously, you're you're a Jets guy. You watch all the time. And that's the thing. I always like talking to people that are level-headed about their team. They could admit some faults and watch them closer than anybody else. What would you say to dynasty leaguers out there with Sam Darnold? Would you say that he's someone that you should move off of? Would you say that he's someone that you should buy low on, that he's got some promising traits and that you think he could be a franchise quarterback? I, I think probably the latter. I, in the end, I don't want to make any firm judgments on what's going on. They are almost undoubtedly going to have a new coaching yes. staff. 
next year. And they're going to hopefully bring in a young offensive minded coach that can sort of mold Darnold because what he's doing, what he's playing with right now. I mean, he, they rarely take shots downfield, although Robbie Anderson and Quincy and were back. They you know, for many of the games, they haven't had a full complement of pass catchers. So for this year, I mean, of course, he's not anywhere close to being relevant. Um, in Dynasty, I certainly would not be saying, no, look, I'm done. I've seen enough from this guy. Uh, I, I can't do it. I do think that he's going to be capable of being a franchise quarterback. In terms of fantasy production, I, I mean, I see him as probably being eventually a QB1, but it, a lot is going to depend on what happens with the coaching staff. you know. But as far as this year, there's I can't see any way that Todd Bowles, with the way the team half the time just doesn't show up, uh, and how mismanaged they are in many ways. I cannot see Todd Bowles surviving this year. We talked about, we said that four weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think once he gets a new system, I think I've seen enough positive traits from him that I think he he can be someone going forward. Nice. Very cool. Um, yeah, but let's hope, you know, frankly, I hope that's not just blind, uh, unbridled <laughs> optimism <laughs> as a Jets fan. For sure. But I do think I, he certainly makes mistakes, but most rookies do. Uh, Vikings 24, Lions 9. We have touched a lot on this game. Stefan Diggs was inactive for this one, um, and he was very clearly the key to Adam Thielen's success because Thielen finally breaks a streak of 100-yard games, just four catches for 22 yards. He does get the touchdown. You did mention that that is kind of the Matt Patricia staple, take away the best, um, sort of a Bill Belichick type thing, take away the best option. That's sort of what they did with Thielen. Not really a very big day from the Vikings offense at all. Kirk Cousins, pretty quiet. No pass catcher, more than 37 yards receiving. We've already already talked about uh dalvin cook and latavius murray anything else on the viking side of the ball no um i mean it, it was pretty disappointing uh adam Dillon's day obviously you know with him seeing more attention with stefan diggs out of the lineup and i think that's what people like when people argue with me about adam Thielen and saying that he's better than stefan diggs it's i'm adam thielen has been awesome and uh, i had him ranked as my number one receiver this week so I obviously bought into that um but Stefan Diggs does a lot. He, I mean, he really does a lot for Adam Thielen. He does, he does take away the top tier cornerback. He does demand some double coverage over the top sometimes because he, he can beat you deep. So I, I think if Stefan Diggs is out, we kind of have to lower expectations for Adam Thielen just a little bit. It was disappointing to see him not, you know, kind of finish on where he started because he was literally, if he had 100 yards this game, he would have broke the all time record for consecutive 100 yard games in a row. So to see him walk away with 22 yards is disappointing. And it's even more disappointing to walk away with seeing Kirk Cousins. Ugh. Yeah, I mean, 100, 162 yards passing just never really had anything going at all. No, he didn't. And the thing is, the Lions are a, a, an offense that you or a defense that you can pass on all day. Like they've been yeah. legit terrible against opposing offenses. But Cousins didn't have to do much. Obviously, the game. I mean, Detroit couldn't do anything offensively, so he didn't have to do much. But it was still a disappointing game. It was. And just to touch on Diggs, uh, um, fantasy owners truly disappointed. I hope you had a backup ready. But, you know, frankly, I, you know, if you we've talked about this actually over last year, too, and this year, Stefan Diggs history when he's on the injury report is not good. Uh, his history uh-huh. off the injury report is great. But when he has any sort of um, injury whatsoever and he's on the report, his production almost always suffers. So, you know, wait till he gets healthy, but have a backup. But don't be too disappointed that he missed this game because he probably, uh, well, considering what Cousins did otherwise, probably would have given you a disappointing performance. Yep. On the other side of the ball, we touched on the pass catchers, but, you know, let's talk a little bit about Carry on Johnson. 12 carries for 37 yards, but this is what we talked about. Theo Riddick had been out and carry on Johnson's activity in the passing game, we thought could be affected by this. And that's exactly what happened. You know, they fell behind. And Theo Riddick, seven catches for 36 yards. Carry on does have three catches, just seven yards. I mean, how confident it, does this game move the needle for you on Carry on Johnson? Yeah, it worried me a little bit because Theo Riddick, like, despite being gone for multiple weeks, like, it was a multiple week absence. And a lot of those times you might see the players ease back in, but he wasn't. Uh, he saw eight targets in that game. Like, he went back to the same exact role. Um, he's. He's not going to eat into carry on Johnson's rushing total, but we already know that Garrett Blunt's going to do that. They're going to give Blunt five to ten touches per game, and he's going to get most of the goal line touches. So carry on Johnson's ceiling is somewhat limited. He's still an RB2 in my rest of season rankings, but uh, just understand that what you're getting with him, he comes with a limited ceiling. And as I mentioned, the Bears are playing the Lions uh, twice over the next three weeks, and the Bears... It was a stat I used before today's game, which it stinks because I now have to like adjust that stat. But coming into this week, the Bears defense had allowed through mind mind you, they've played seven games. They had only allowed four running backs to score more than five point two PPR points against them. Um, the Bears defense has been ridiculous. They still have yet to allow a rushing touchdown to a running back. Uh, and with Theo Riddick in the in the fold, I just 
carry on Johnson in two of the next three weeks, he's probably not going to finish in like RB1 or RB2 territory. Yeah. So where do you think you have him roughly going forward? Uh, I will tell you exactly where I have him. I have him as my RB17. Uh, uh, I, I would I would think long and hard uh, about someone like Marlon Mack or him. Who would you rather have? Carry on Johnson, Marlon Mack, or let's throw another one in there, Adrian Peterson. Uh, I have it. Let me see. From last week, I had it all pretty close, to be clear, which is, I think, why you're asking. Mm-hmm. But I had it Peterson, Mack, and then Carry on Johnson. And I think I'm wrong. I think I may have it. Oh, boy, this is tough. Mack has some tough matchups going forward, too. I think despite today's, you know, really tremendously terrible effort, I think I'll still have Peterson, Mack, Johnson. I think I'm going to keep it in that order. It's not that far away, but I think Johnson for me, again, this is sort of the reason. You know, we, we've only seen a couple of games of him getting substantial work and looking good. And I do think, frankly, uh, with Riddick back, that it, it is going to affect how he does in the passing game. And I don't really see him being a strong RB2 absent that work. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. No, and that's that's the thing. Like Peterson, like now he's missing the, the the entire left side of his offensive line. That's obviously a concern. So there's there's concerns for a lot of running backs. And that's why I say outside of like the top 12, 13 running backs, it's man, you're playing the matchups. That's kind of how it feels right now. And like to get into RP2 territory is not too hard. Like it, it, yeah. it really is not like the, the fact that Jordan Howard is still in my in my number 23 running back. It kind of says a lot. No, I agree. And frankly, it almost I feel bad sometimes when people ask us either who do you start or who do you have higher in your rest of season rankings? Mm-hmm. Because, again, a, a, a 10 spot difference might mean absolutely nothing yeah. because you're dart throwing. Basically, at that point, you're like, I, you know, I like this guy a little bit better, but it's really fairly close. But talking about Peterson, let's move into that game. Falcons 38, Redskins 14. Since we're talking about Peterson, let's start on that side of the ball. Just nine nine carries for 17 yards. I mean, they were behind, but is this the offensive line problem? Is this just a one-off? How are you feeling? This seems like the second time where Adrian Peterson has had like a smash spot and he just kind of let down. I remember that against the Colts earlier in the season, I viewed him as an RB1 that you had to play. And then in this matchup, I had him like once I heard that Chris Thompson was out, it was like, it was a matchup that always better suited Chris Thompson's skill set. And I I was going to love Chris Thompson this week if he had played, but knowing that he had a rib injury and that he was out, it was like, okay, Adrian Peterson's going to get some receptions. Obviously, he should be able to run the ball a little bit against Atlanta. I feel like he's still a low-end RB1, and obviously letting down the similar to the way he did against Indianapolis. I think against Indianapolis early in the year, I think he had like, it was like 10 or 11 carries with like 20-something yards, so it was a similar type day for him. I don't know. It's so tough, man, to know. Like I, I gave Bobby a stat on the podcast last week that there are I think there were 49 running backs this year who have had games of 98 or more rushing yards. Nobody had more of those games than Adrian Peterson. Adrian Peterson had five of those games and no other running back had more than four. So do I want to take one game and say I should use this against Adrian Peterson? No, probably not. Atlanta's de- Atlanta's defense has been playing better the last couple of weeks. I just think my concern about Peterson, my concern about Alex Smith the Redskins have no offense, like legitimately no offense outside of him. Like, how dare you besmirch the good name of Mo Harris? Oh, okay, yeah. because 10, 10 catches, 124 yards, man. This guy is a wide receiver. I'm sorry. I'm just teasing. Um, obviously, <laughs> you're correct. Of course, they have nothing. Alex Smith does not throw the ball down the field anymore. He's reverted completely to old school. Yeah. Uh, Alex Smith, it, I mean, why would you ever fear anything in this passing game? Why wouldn't you just say, you know that guy, you know that 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 big guy yep. who uh, gains 100 yards every every week? Let's just take him out of the game. I mean, that's what they do. Jordan Reed, again, another game where he does absolutely nothing. Six, uh, four uh, catches for 34 yards, and apparently he aggravated his neck injury mm. at the end of the game. So, I mean, realistically, it's scary. With that said, they do get the Bucks next Play week. Vernon and Davis. I mean, let's go. Get everybody out there yeah. against the Bucks, but <laughs> I agree. I am concerned about this. It was unfortunate. I, I do think that the injuries to the offensive line hurt him, but I'm certainly starting him against the Bucks, and I don't think I'm going to drop him that much at this point. Mm-hmm. I'm willing to, given his track record, I'm willing to say, okay, really bad game. I, I'm not going to overreact to this one. Uh, I'm going to give him another shot. If he disappoints against the Bucks, then I'm going to probably freak out. But again, all, the Falcons were also coming off their bye. Uh-huh. I'm sure they game plan tremendously for this game. So I, I'm willing to give a little bit of the pass offensively for the Falcons. I mean, everything was clicking. Four touchdown passes for Matt Ryan. Tevin Coleman has the huge day with two receiving touchdowns. Ito Smith gets the rushing touchdown. Calvin Ridley gets a touchdown. And some weird dude named Julio Jones found the end zone. Ten targets, seven catches, 121 yards. And a touchdown. So thankfully, we do not have to worry about the fact that he has not scored yet. Is there anything you want to talk about here with the Falcons or just, wow, great game. Let's hope they keep it going next week against the Browns. (laughs) 
Uh, Julio Jones, man. Um, so happy for that guy. Uh, seriously, I'm tired of hearing it. Um, Julio Jones, best wide receiver in the game, in my opinion. And uh, I'm just you see the whole team go out there and celebrate with him after that. And, and Julio Jones has admitted that it's really affected the offensive play calling and the fact that everybody knows it's hanging over their head. So it's good to see him score. And it was on a, a, a screenplay where he kind of took it. It was like 35 yards, 40 yards yep. after the t- after the catch. But the real interesting thing here in this game that most people won't know by seeing the box score is that Josh Norman was shadowing Julio Jones all over the field. Like he covered him in the slot and everything. And that's something that, that Josh Norman has not done at all in Washington. So they changed something for this game and it obviously didn't work um, because Julio, you know, 10 targets, seven catches, 121 yards and a touchdown. He's just a freak. And Josh Norman's kind of past the prime in his career, though he may be better in man coverage than he is at playing sides. But yeah, the- I think, I think last week though, he, for the most part, when he was on Odell, I read a, uh, a stat that he, he shut him down pretty good in, in coverage. In terms, I don't know yeah, if he allowed in the times right? that he did see him, but he wasn't shadowing Odell around the field like he did Julio mm-hmm. today. But I mean, Odell, I mean, he hasn't really been himself this year either. Um, in terms of like what I've seen him do on the football field, but I, I don't know. Like it's just, it's, I, I'm, I'm happy that Washington is willing to change things on defense if they feel like something isn't working. And I think that some people have overrated that defense. They're a really good run defense, even though they didn't necessarily show it today, but the Falcons, people need to stop sleeping on this offense. Like I am writing. So like what I do on Sunday night, I go through my rest of season rankings. I start doing um, some buy, sell, hold notes for each player. And Matt Ryan is like a buy for me. The only quarterbacks that I would rather have for the rest of the season are Patrick Mahomes and Aaron Rodgers. If you can trade away Drew Brees, Tom Brady, Cam Newton, any of these guys for Matt Ryan, do it. I really feel like the Falcons offense is kind of like the Rams offense, but nobody wants to admit it because Sean McVay is not calling the plays. But they have three wide receivers who are typically relevant every single week. Tevin Coleman's a good pass catching running back. They don't have a run game. Like the, the running game isn't that strong. They, they, their offensive line is a little bit weakened. Their defense isn't top notch. They're going to allow some points. So I, I want every part of this offense that I can get. Yeah, I'm with you on Ryan. I have him a little lower than you do. I have him fifth coming into this week. And I, I don't think I'm going to be moving him ahead of Mahomes, Rodgers, Cam, or Breeze. But I agree. Other than that, for me, he's right up there. Um, and this was really impressive because Ryan's not always that great outdoors on the road, frankly. I mean, in his career, generally speaking, but they looked great today. They're humming. I'm sure they'll beat up on the Browns next week. So certainly if you can get a piece of this offense, you should do so. Uh, Panthers 42, Bucks 28. True or false tags? If you combine the Bucks defense with the Bills offense, you would have the worst team in the history of football. <laughs> <You're> right? <laughs> I mean, come on. I think I feel like there should be some game maker out there that should create a team just like it's that. But so uh, bad. The, it's so terrible. The Panthers, I, it, disappointing from a fantasy perspective for Cam, right? Because yeah. they had you know all the touchdowns. He only has two, but they were just in control the whole game. Mm-hmm. Christian McCaffrey. With a huge game, 157 total yards, two touchdowns. Greg Olson has a great touchdown catch, 76 yards. Kind of quiet day for the wide receivers. We were all looking at maybe DJ Moore. Devin Funches doesn't do much, but they just didn't really need to do anything. Any takeaways from the Panther side of the ball? It was funny. Um, well, I, I have a lot of Christian McCaffrey um, supporters on my timeline every single week, and if I ever say anything bad about him, they're quick to let me know when he does something well. And um, naturally, I got, you know, some tweets today and I said, did you guys look at my primer this week? Did you look at my rankings? I had Christian McCaffrey as my number three running back, number three behind only Todd Gurley and Kareem Hunt. So, I mean, I was pretty high on him this week. It was a fantastic matchup that I felt like the, the Panthers could have done anything they wanted against the Bucks, And it was just it was always trouble trying to figure out which avenue they, they would have taken. Right. Like Devin Funches could have had a big game. Nobody would have been shocked. DJ Moore was like a favorite of everybody as a sleeper. And I talked about him on the live stream this morning saying that he might not be as safe as people think he is. Uh, and he ends up with just one catch for 16 yards. He has 32 yards on the ground. But it's this team is a better real life offense than they are for fantasy. That's how oh, yeah. For oh, without without question. I mean, this was kind of a tough spot because if you felt like they were playing in a negative game script, everybody could have gone nuts. But they they had this game totally in control. I mean, they for a minute, Fitzmagic happened and they, you know, the Bucks <laughs> got to within seven and everybody was like, whoa, but realistically, they were never going to lose this game. They could do whatever they want. It's really an exciting offense. But yeah, fantasy wise. It's it's tough. You know, I don't think you can really rely too much on the pass catchers. I mean, I, I do think Cam McCaffrey Olsen every week starts. And then, you know, Devin Funches is going to be what he's going to be. This is one of his worst games, but he's going to be a five for 70 type guy every week. And then once in a while, DJ Moore is going to have a big game or Curtis Samuel or something like that. But I agree. It was a little difficult of a game to project because they, they just had their way completely. On the other side of the ball, Ryan Fitzpatrick again does have Fitzmagic. He throws four touchdown patches. He has been named the starter already for next week. 
So they're going to keep that going. And next week they face the Redskins, which is a tough defense today notwithstanding. Uh, Adam Humphreys, really the pass catcher that has the huge day, eight catches, all eight of his targets, 82 yards, two touchdowns. O.J. Howard, my man, two touchdowns, mm. which was great to see. Um, but let's briefly talk, are you taking anything at all away from Mike Evans' quiet day? Ten targets, but just one catch against 16 16- uh, for 16 yards, he's usually great with Fitzpatrick. I imagine James Bradbury was in shadow mm-hmm. coverage today against him. And Deshaun Jackson, only two catches for 32 yards. Again, the, the Panthers had the, the one guy, Dante Jackson, that can really match him uh, for speed. And I think Jackson had that pick. So is there anything you want to take away from the passing game here? Um, well, the thing is, is like I didn't understand a lot of things like what people were expecting from Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, and Deshaun Jackson this week because all three of them were ranked as top 36 options. But the um, the Carolina defense has only allowed three wide receivers to finish top 25 against them all season uh, in PPR format. So I was like, you kind of have to pick one. Like it's it's very unlikely that all three of them get in there, let alone two or whatever. I thought Mike Evans would have a better game because he's historically he's had a better uh, stat line against James Bradbury. Like in every matchup they've had, he's done really well. Um, so this was just, I think it was just an off week for Mike Evans. I think that Ryan, I think we would have called him Fitch tragic if you guys had watched the beginning of that game, because like it was ugly. Um, and I was, I started wondering to myself, I'm like, how soon is he going to get benched? Because I think it's like a, a situation where it's very fluid. And I don't think that they should be naming starters because I don't even know if Dirk Cutter makes it through the week as the head coach. Like, I think he's very close to getting fired. Um, and you know, this, this team as a whole, I don't, I don't feel like they have a chance to win the division. I don't think they're a contender. So there's a lot of questions I have about the Bucks yeah. team right now, but Mike Evans, I wouldn't panic about him. Deshaun Jackson, he's the one I would panic a little bit about because he's been seeing declining snaps uh, for each of the last three weeks. Chris Godwin is playing over him for the most part. Adam Humphrey still has his role. Um, Deshaun Jackson has been fourth among wide receivers and snaps, so he's more of like the boom bust wide receiver. But yeah, OJ Howard continues to get it done on limited targets. Like that guy is so good. I just wish he'd get targeted more. Yeah, I agree. Although you can argue with two touchdowns, frankly. Um, but I really do think I, I could be wrong, but I think there was a, a chance that if how I believe it was Howard who caught the touchdown right before halftime, that Fitzpatrick may have been benched uh, at coming out of the half. Although, mm-hmm. frankly, the the problem with with Cutter going back to Winston is that he, he just runs out of people to blame at uh-huh. some point. I mean, he's firing his coaches, right? If he if he just goes, oh, well, I guess I have to go back to the other quarterback. I feel like that might be, frankly, kind of admitting the last you're, out of, uh, right, you're out of excuses. So I don't really know. But I, I do think that within a couple of weeks, um, Fitzpatrick is going to go back to the bench at some point, uh, whether or not it's because Cutter's been fired or not. But again, he does it from a fantasy perspective somehow, which he does every week. Mm-hmm. Uh, Steelers 23, Ravens 16. Really impressive effort, I thought, from the Steelers here. Uh, they don't usually have big offensive games in Baltimore, but Big Ben looked good. 270 yards, two touchdowns, had you know, and a rushing touchdown. Mm-hmm. He did have what looked like a scary shoulder injury, but it turned out, I guess, he just got the wind knocked out of yep. him because he was back in there after a play. James Conner continues to eat 170 yards rushing, plus 56 yards. And a touchdown through the air. Uh, Juju Smith-Schuster has a decent game. Antonio Brown kind of quiet, but he does find the end zone. Uh, what do you want to talk about with the Steelers? Here? Uh, James Conner um, continues to get it done. And uh, the more that people want to hear about this Le'Veon Bell thing, like when's he coming back? Like, you know, what's the deadline? What do these deadlines mean? And uh, the deadline is the twenty is the the twelfth. It's the twelfth or thirteenth of this month, where it's after. It's the Tuesday after next yes, week. Yes, it's right? after the Week Ten game. So therefore, you're not going to have him for Week Ten. I can promise you that. The question is, does he show up the Tuesday after? Because if he does not show up by that day, basically he cannot play for the rest of the season. He can't show up any other week. He can't decide when he comes back. He legitimately cannot play. So if he does not return and play, then he's out for the season. That means that the Steelers can tran- uh, transition tag him next year, which uh, is even a, it's a lesser number, if I'm not mistaken, than the franchise tag. But whatever the case is, I don't think the Steelers are going to do it. And that's why I think Le'Veon Bell, it's a very... It's a likely scenario where he doesn't play this year, where he says, you know what, I've held out this long. I'm just going to wait. I'm going to get to free agency. They're not going to tag me because they have James Conner who's playing out of his mind. Even if I came back, do I want to be embarrassed in the fact that I'm going to return to a team that's not going to play me? Because I don't, this offensive line is fed up with him. The defense is fed up with him. Anytime you see a, a coach or a player asked a question about Le'Veon Bell, they're like, please ask me about something that matters. Like, they don't care about him right now. He legitimately is an afterthought on this football team. So I don't, even if he returns, I don't think he returns to a workhorse role. I I stand by that. I think he's a sell. Like, if you have him in a fantasy league and someone's willing to give you a usable piece, like, I would take Tariq Cohen for him right now. Yeah, so we talk about this almost every week, and I have been much higher on Connor than most of the industry coming in because I I did, you know, once it became clear that he was going to wait, 
as soon as it, it's not, he's not going to show up and suddenly, oh, there you go. You're going to just dominate carries. That's not how this is going to work. Also, by the way, if you were excited about Bell, remember last year he held out and then he struggled the first couple of weeks. It takes a little while to get back up to speed. But along the lines of what you said, I think his name is Mike Florio is at Pro Football Talk. He floated something interesting earlier this week that I saw. What if the Steelers and Bell make sort of a wink and a nod agreement? Sort of, they don't put it out there mm-hmm. and they, you're not allowed to say it, but they say, okay, here's the deal, Le'Veon. You do not show up at all. We do not have to pay you the additional however much you'd make this year, $3 million or something like that. And we'll just agree, we will not tag you next year. Everybody wins. We have Connor. We like Connor. We avoid the controversy. You get your free agency. We save a little money for the rest of the year. How about that? I think that's a completely plausible scenario because I do think at this point when Bell comes back, it's embarrassing. Connor has been awesome the entire year. They hate him over there. They're probably, they. there's no guarantee they're going to use him very much. And frankly, if he comes back and he struggles, it only hurts him. So I think there's a very real possibility he's not even going to bother showing up on the field at all, whether it's because of what you said in the gamble that they're just not going to tag him or whether or not there's some sort of quiet side agreement that says, you know what, mm-hmm. we'll save a little bit of money. You don't show up and rock the boat because they're humming right now. They're doing well. It's a great matchup. I think it's on Thursday uh, against the Panthers, which will be a, a fun game to watch. Yeah. Um, I, I really think that frankly he's just he's I don't think he's going to matter for fantasy I don't think it's going to affect Connor's value at all I'd be very happy rolling with him so I think we're both relatively on the same page but that was an interesting sort of uh, floating idea from uh, Mike Florio so I hope that comes to fruition Uh, on the other side of the ball the Ravens just a mess all the rumors that John Harbaugh uh, is on the uh, hot seat uh, the entire passing game pretty much held in check Michael Crabtree and John Brown I mean Alex Collins finds the end zone uh, which is good. And the, the one notable thing I'll say about that is that Buck Allen was in the game. There was a pass interference call that brought them down to the one yard line and they took out Allen and they brought in Collins for the one yard goal line carry. Mm-hmm. So it, that at least to me showed that, okay, we're not really worried right now about the fumbles. But other than that, it was just kind of a disastrous game. Is there anything you want to talk about with the Ravens? No, I think this was the last game that Buck Allen was going to see any playing time, like significant playing time, because I think Ty Montgomery, they traded for him to kind of take on that role. My The disappointing line for me here is Hayden Hurst uh, seeing just two targets in this matchup it was really one where the the, Joe Flacco should have exploited the safety play of the Steelers Uh, the Steelers the young safeties there have really struggled uh, against tight ends they they just don't have good communication with the linebackers and there's often a gap in between the two where there's a soft spot for a lot of tight ends and we've seen so many teams exploit this so to see you know Mark Andrews three catches 50 yards on six targets but there was a play in mind where I was watching and Hayden Hurst got right over the top of TJ Watt and there, there was like a soft spot that soft spot that I keep watching in the defense Flacco was looking directly in the option in the area but instead he threw it to the player in front I think it was Willie Sneed he threw it uh, underneath in front of the linebacker like Joe Flacco is back to playing scared. He's not playing well. Uh, I, you know, we're now hearing that Harbaugh is on the hot seat, which I don't necessarily agree with. But I think that I really think they should have fired the, uh, Marty Morningwig when they brought in Lamar Jackson. Like, I think this team needs a new offensive coordinator. I think Harbaugh is a good coach. Um, but if he's in the hot seat, you know, they're talking about the chances that he might be fired. They're talking about, um, that they may go to Lamar Jackson coming out of the bye week that nobody really knows what's going on. So there's a whole lot of questions here, but the lack of usage for Hayden Hurst, the lack of aggressiveness by Joe Flacco, it's just, it's disappointing. Yeah, Flacco in particular is playing really poorly. I, I mean, if you, early on in the game, there was, they were approaching the end zone and Lamar Jackson was in the game with Flacco and he was wide open in the end zone and instead Flacco threw it into double well, yeah, coverage. Well, yeah, Flacco's got tunnel vision right now. Like he's playing, yeah. he's like literally playing by the play. He's not going through options. Like he's just, it's tunnel vision. And granted that play, Lamar Jackson that you're talking about, I, I, I was watching a lot of this game and uh, I don't know if Jackson was designed to even run much of a route, but Flacco, the fact that he doesn't even have the peripheral vision to see that Lamar Jackson is standing there without there's nobody within 15 yards of him uh, could have just tossed him a touchdown but yeah yeah it was ugly man yeah, it's ugly. That whole team is ugly. Now, they do have a relatively soft schedule coming out of the bye after that, but but really, you know, I, I'd be concerned for the most part. Yeah. Uh, I do think Collins will have value, but everybody else I'd be a little worried about. Okay, the uh, afternoon games, let's uh, get through these a little quickly yeah. because we were, frankly, they were ending right as we were coming yeah. on. Texans 19, Broncos 17. Brandon McManus misses two field goals, including one, as time expired for the Texans' sixth win in a row, I believe, after starting 0-3. 
Um, DeAndre Hopkins doing his thing, 10 catches, 105 <laughs> yards, and a touchdown. Nice debut for Demarius Thomas. I mean, only three catches, but all of his targets, 61 yards. Um, Lamar Miller really struggles here. 12 carries, 21 yards. Alfred Blue, not all that much better, but did see more targets. Any thoughts on Lamar Miller or the running game generally going forward? I know Deonta Foreman now is, uh, I think he has a couple of weeks to come back at this point. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I don't, I wouldn't hold my hopes up for, for Foreman. Uh, running backs returning from Achilles injuries don't tend to, uh, they don't, they don't fare very well. Uh, and knowing that he wasn't even ready after week six, which was when he was able to come off the pup list. Um, the fact that he still wasn't ready tells me a lot. So I'm not relying on him. Lamar Miller, he is who we thought he was. You know, he had two good games, one against a tough uh, defense, one against a really bad one. This one, I, I, I wasn't as high on him as everybody else. I felt like Denver's defense, what they allowed to Todd Gurley was because they just wanted to limit the passing game and it worked. The Isaiah Crowell game was the outlier and everything, but I don't, you know, I think someone, I think it was Marcus Grant on, on Twitter, he posted saying, I, I still don't know if the Houston team is good. Um, like, even though they're six and three now, I still don't know if they're like a really good football team. That that secondary has so many injuries to them. They don't have very much depth on offense, like, because Lamar Miller is not a great running back, so they don't have a strong run game. Uh, they have DeAndre Hopkins. They added Demarius Thomas, who, that's a nice one-two punch. Once they get Kiki QT back after their bye week, they have three solid receivers, um, but they have no depth behind them. So I, I just don't know if this team has enough to get through like the tough part of their schedule. So Demarius, they did have to call a timeout today because he didn't know the play. Like he was kind of like had his hand up and <sighs> Demarius Thomas is actually the one that called the timeout on offense. It was kind of <laughs> funny to watch it happen. Um, but it was his first game with the team. He has a buy. He should be more productive going forward. Yeah, he does have the bye week next week, so I'm sure he'll be a little more integrated mm-hmm. going forward, but no, certainly not all that disappointing if you were forced to start him. Uh, on the Broncos side of the ball, no Royce Freeman again. Devontae Booker uh, vultures the touchdown. He does lose a fumble, though, to the extent that affects him going forward. Uh, thoughts on Cortland Sutton? Now, this was the reason behind the Demarius Thomas trade. He gets five targets, three catches for 57 yards. Any thoughts on his debut as the number two? Uh, yeah, I I told people that, like, don't sell your soul to get Cortland Sutton. Uh, I felt like his role was expanding even when Demarius Thomas was on the team, and I didn't know how much more they were going to put on him. I think people started to think, like, he was going to be, like, all of a sudden he's going to be, like, Robert Woods and perform like that, like an Alshon Jeffrey, just because he's walking into a bigger workload. It doesn't mean that. He still has Case Keenum throwing in the football. His schedule coming up was tough. Like, out of the bye week now, he's going to be going against the Chargers, which means he's going to see a lot of Casey Hayward. Then he's going to go up against Pittsburgh. He's probably going to see a lot of Joe Hayden. Cincinnati's a decent matchup. But again, now you're talking about three weeks, four weeks down the road where you're going to start to get some good matchups. So Sutton is going to be in the wide receiver three conversation. But uh, to see him walk away with five targets when Case Keenum threw the ball 42 times, it's not ideal. Yeah, it was disappointing. He also dropped uh, a touchdown. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't, it wasn't that easy, but he certainly should have been able to come down with it. It was a little disappointing for me, but I, I still think I'm going to have him, you know, right in that relatively strong wide receiver three range. I don't know about you, Tags, but that, that's about where I have him, you know, probably 30th. Yeah, I, I have think, him 33 right now. Yeah, I think that's about where I'll have him, probably a little higher than that. But I agree, nothing to to get too concerned about. But I, I didn't really view him as a league winner. I certainly viewed him as somebody who you needed to add for sure if you were had any concerns about your wide receiver depth, but not a guy who's going to make that big of an impact. Uh, Chargers 25, Seahawks 17. The you know Seahawks made a furious charge at the end, but they just couldn't complete the comeback. Uh, on the Chargers side of the ball, pretty much all good. Keenan Allen starts his second half surge. Six catches, 124 yards, mm. plus 28 yards rushing on the ground. Anything you want to take away from the Chargers? No, not really. Mike Williams had an awesome touchdown. Like It was a highlight reel type touchdown. It was his only catch of the game. Tyrell Williams, he did score a touchdown as well, but he was limited. I, I talked about it in the primer saying that the Seahawks haven't allowed many big plays on defense, and that kind of continued. There was one big play to Keenan Allen they did allow, but it, it, it was it was just a very workmanlike performance. Melvin Gordon played a lot better than I thought he would. Yeah, he played great. 16 carries, 113 yards in the touchdown. Yeah, but my concern is more on the other side of the ball. Like, Russell Wilson finally threw the ball more than, like, 26 times, which is good, but he didn't look very good today. Um, no. He's been, like, on point with his accuracy, you know, the last month, but he just didn't look good today. Uh, he, he's not the reason... Not the complete reason they lost the game today. Obviously, Chris Carson went down with his hip injury. He was questionable all week with that hip injury. Re-injured it, was pulled from the game. They said he wasn't coming back. So Mike Davis took over the workload. He played okay. But um, the, the loser of this game, the one who, who stock took the biggest hit is David Moore. David Moore, he only catches two of seven uh, targets. Two of them went right off of his hands, were clear drops, including the game-winning uh, potential game-tying, I should say, potential game-tying touchdown pass where uh, he... Literally, it just bounced right off of his chest. It should have been a touchdown. Um, he had a bad game. 
and uh, yeah. there's not much else I, I mean, can say about it. This is the one thing that's concerned me about Wilson. I mean, he's he. I think his touchdown percentage. I think almost 17 percent of his passes were touchdowns. Oh, it was he, ridiculous. Not, yeah, right. It's you're not going to do that. That's like five percent higher than the greatest in history or more than that frankly so you're not going to do that going forward and yeah this was a game where he just didn't look quite as good even though he threw almost 40 times he did rush for 41 yards which it, that's at least something that I'm I'm waiting for because I think that really is the only way for Russell Wilson to finish as this top six type quarterback but yeah disappointing effort um, really from from all of the Seahawks going forward uh, for in this game I mean um, but you know going forward you know I, I my guess is that uh, Wilson will, I mean, he, he does have the Rams next week, uh, but as we'll see right now, you can certainly score points on the Rams at this point, and that's our final game. And the Saints 45, the Rams 35, this was still going on as we started recording. So, Tags, go ahead, just talk about it. Buddy. Well, I love, you I love that you game? said that Michael Thomas was left uncovered. I, I don't see it that way. I see it as a, a, a Charles Tillman, Steve Smith incident. If you don't, If you don't know what I'm talking about, the Bears played the Panthers. This is back, Jesus. Uh, maybe like two, th- it was a, like, 2005 to 2010 era. Um, it was a while ago when Steve Smith was on the Panthers and Charles Tillman pretended to trip and fall down when Steve Smith burned him on a route. And Marcus Peters, I think just, he was sick of getting beat up by Michael Thomas all day long. Like Michael Thomas literally put on a clinic. I knew that would happen. Marcus Peters is not a shadow cornerback that you have to worry about against someone like Michael Thomas. And I tweeted out, I'm proud of this one. I tweeted out, I said, if the, if the Rams want to trust Marcus Peters, against Michael Thomas, he's going to put on a clinic and he's going to eat. And he did. He did just that. And Marcus Peters was like, I don't know what happened after the play. He knows exactly what happened. Like he, he, he I, was tired of it. Look, I, I get it. I'm personally, am a little disappointed with 12 catches and 211 yards <laughs> and a touchdown, but I get, no, Marcus Peters actually has quietly really struggled. Yeah, he has really, really struggled um, this season. They missed to uh in that secondary and, and the defense, I mean, it's it's still overall a solid defense. They have a rough schedule, um, so it's it's not exactly a defense, I think, you know, and then they have their bye still to go mm-hmm. in week yep. 12, so it's a defense that you might have to move on from. Um, anything else you want to talk about? Everybody kind of has a nice game uh, in this one yeah, I think, for the most part. I think part. Mark Ingram is a buy low. I, 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 there's a lot of people on my timeline telling me right now that Mark Ingram, like, he can't be trusted and this and that, and I... I mean, I know he fumbled. I know he didn't do much. I know Kamara had two touchdowns in this game well, on the ground, and then he had a th- I think he had a third one receiving. Um, but com- it's going to even out, guys. Like, Elvin Kamara is still the running back to own, and I said that even after Mark Ingram had his two-touchdown game on that on that it was a Sunday or Monday night game against, the, against Washington. But I'm telling you right now that Mark Ingram, there are, like, if you can get Mark Ingram for Jordan Howard right now, like, legitimately, like, you can't press accept fast enough. I would rather have Mark Ingram than someone like, I, I would put him in the territory of someone like Carrion Johnson, but I think I'd rather have Mark Ingram. Uh, yeah, I am just right now trying to find him on my. Oh yeah, by far. I I mean I think I had him. Oh wild tags coming to this week. You had him eight. Yeah, I did. I, I felt the... like he was coming off a couple tough matchups. This one it's going to force me to drop him down a little bit more because Kamara is getting tons of work on the goal line. So I have to yeah. uh, like respect that. But I still think Ingram. I put him actually at number sixteen right now. Yeah, to, I mean, I am at 13 coming in, so it's not as if I was, you know, light years uh, away from you, but um, I agree, and I'll drop him a little bit, but certainly, I mean, he's a good 10 spots ahead of Jordan Howard, so if you can do that, you should do that. I'm not concerned, and he was fine. I mean, he did fumble, as you mentioned, and it looked like he hurt his arm, but he was fine. He still got work, and he was in on the goal line, but then he was tackled just short, and then Kamara came in and got the touchdown, so I agree. I wouldn't be worried too much. All right, Tags. Well, look, we've had a great show. We have a great game that is about to start that we are going to get to watch. So that is all for today's show. But before we go, I do want to say a quick thank you again to the sponsor of today's show, Lisa Mattress. Remember, with our offer code, you can get $160 off a Lisa Mattress. Just go to lisa.com slash fantasy pros. That's L-E-E-S-A dot com slash fantasy pros. On behalf of everyone here at Fantasy Pros, thanks for listening. Enjoy your football. I just wanted you to watch me dissolve